Welcome to this episode of Global Health Insights at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. I'm Pauline Chu in Media Relations. In this podcast, we'll be discussing the latest research on diabetes. Dr. Liana Ong is lead research scientist and first author of a new study that's published in The Lancet. And Lauren Stafford is the second author of the same paper. Thank you both of you for being with us for this discussion. Diabetes affects so many people and your research unveils some really staggering statistics. Um, Dr. Ong, let me start with you. This is the most comprehensive study of diabetes available today, and it looks at the past 30 years as well as projects into the next three decades. What would you say the main findings are of this research? I think that the main findings, um, well, first of all, thank you, Pauline. Uh, I think that the main findings are that we're expecting to see diabetes continue to increase. Um, we've seen an increase over the past 30 years, and we're going to continue to see it increase uh, to the point that we're expecting to see about 1.3 billion people have to have diabetes um, by 2050. So 1.3 billion. And what is causing this surge that we're expected to see in the next 30 years? Um, it's actually a combination of multiple factors and multiple things. Um, and so it is a combination of modifiable risk factors, things like high BMI, a diet, physical activity, but it's also things like aging and population growth um, that are all contributing towards the increase that we're going to observe. In fact, your paper says that no country will see a decrease in diabetes, which is which is quite a staggering projection. Um, Lauren, let me uh, bring you into the conversation. You really focus on different regions as you're looking at where diabetes will surge. And you're paying a special you're, you're paying special attention to North Africa, the Middle East, as well as um, certain islands in the Pacific. Can you tell us what's going on in these regions? Yeah, thank you, Pauline. Um, yeah, so like you said, um, the two hardest hit regions um, we expect um, to be hit by 2050 are North Africa and the Middle East, and then um, Oceania, which includes a lot of the smaller Pacific Island nations like American Samoa and Fiji. Um, and like Dr. Ong said, we think that will be largely driven by um, high body mass index or BMI. Um, we've seen that um, in 2021, about 50% of the burden um, due to type 2 diabetes can be attributed to um, high body mass index. Um, so that's definitely a really big driver. Um, and in those um, regions, North Africa and the Middle East, and um, the small Pacific Island nations by 2050, we expect that about one in five people um, will be living with type 2, or sorry, total diabetes. Um, uh, which is pretty alarming uh, and significant. So Dr. Ong, um, Lauren mentioned high BMI or obesity, and this is uh, to some extent preventable when you talk about type 2 diabetes. Uh, if, it's, if obesity is one of the main drivers, is this an issue of better diet and exercise? And then we may not see these projections, the, the, the numbers surge so much. Um, I think that that is a pretty simplistic way of um, looking at the, the problem. Um, there is going to be some component of that um, for sure, but I don't think that we know yet that it will completely solve the increases that we're seeing. We also know that not everyone who has a higher BMI will develop diabetes and not everybody with diabetes has a high BMI. So it's a bit of um, what we know are strong risk factors. Um, and so it, can't hurt, but it's um, hard to know how much of a difference it will make. Um, we can make some educated guesses, but uh, this is not, that's not what this paper did. It was just to quantify um, the relationship between the two. Okay. And, and not only obesity, but 15 other risk factors that you looked at as well. Can you talk about them? Because they range from uh, air pollution to low physical activity to obesity? Sure, yes. So we looked at 16 uh, most detailed risk factors. Um, they include you know, high BMI, as you mentioned, low physical activity, um, series of different diets. So like high sugar sweet beverages, uh, low vegetable, um, red meat. Uh, they also included things um, like environmental and occupational exposure. So like you mentioned, air pollution. 
Um, it also included things like tobacco and alcohol. These are all risk factors that have been associated with type 2 diabetes in the literature. So there have been previous studies that have looked at the relationship between each of these risk factors and the development of diabetes. Okay, so you, you're looking at all of these risk factors. So, so let's put it together. If, if we know what these risk factors are and we are anticipating this huge surge of more than 1 billion people with diabetes in 2050, I mean, what can be done right now? So if we solved all risk factors, um, the most that we would help control diabetes is about 50%. If, if, we were, if everybody was 100% correct and um, if this, was, this was everything. Um, but we know that about 50% of that, the diabetes increase that we're expecting to see is also going to be contributed by population growth and aging. And that's actually really going to tend to steer us towards thinking about health systems and health infrastructure. And our country is going to be prepared because the reality is, is that oftentimes people with diabetes don't realize that they have diabetes um, until they have caused irreversible damage to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, in some ways that you can call diabetes silent in that way. It, it doesn't kind of manifest itself until it's too late. Um, and many health systems are not prepared or they don't proactively identify uh, individuals that are have high blood sugar until it's too late. And so what happens is that health systems can actually intervene if they can identify these individuals earlier. They can help them monitor their blood sugar better. They can monitor their systems, like their um, whether or not they're developing neuropathy or vision loss. And when you can monitor, when you can minimize the effect of high blood sugar on the system, you can also decrease risk to other complications like heart disease and stroke that we know are also associated with high blood sugar. So really, you know, in my opinion, if you really wanted to tackle as much of 100% of the sources of the increase of diabetes, we would think about this not from a risk factor perspective, we would think about this from a health systems perspective. What can we, um, what can countries do to shore up their health systems that can also address uh, modifiable risk factors, but also um, make sure that they can monitor and maintain um, individuals who are, you know, unfortunately going to develop diabetes because of um, the aging impact, the aging effect, um, population growth, and other, you know, uncontrollable um, uh, contributors towards the development of diabetes. Okay, so early early detection can be very helpful. A early and Lauren, sorry, excuse me. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say. Um, it's it's early detection, but also proactive education, proactive maintenance. Many of the risk factors that we talk about um, are behaviors that once they're ingrained within individuals, they're very hard to disentangle and to change. So if we can kind of target these things from a social society, societal point of view, um, and think long term, we'll be in a much better place to help generations of individuals. Okay, so early detection and proactive maintenance. And, and what are some of the behaviors, Lauren, um, that are very difficult to change that, that you're seeing when you look at the, the prevalence of diabetes? Yeah, um, so like we mentioned, um, some of the main risk factors have to do with diet um, and physical activity um, and smoking. And you know those types of uh, behaviors are very ingrained. And so sometimes it's really hard to um, break those habits. Um, and also, I think um, there are a lot of different structural things at play as well. Um, so whether people have um, access to healthy foods um, or grocery stores nearby, and um, as well as foods that are affordable, and if their, you know, environment that they live in um, is accessible and, um, you know, conducive to physical activity and those sorts of things. Um, so we have to think about it, like Dr. Ong said, um, from behavior side, but also at the societal and structural level as well. And Lauren, let's look at age because your paper also looks at diabetes in different age groups and diabetes is especially prevalent at age 65 and older. And the highest rate that you found in 2021 was 24.4% between the age of 75 to 79. So why are those age groups particularly vulnerable? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think naturally as the body ages, um, people tend to just have higher glucose levels. Um, so that's definitely a component. Um, and, you know, after we do see that it peaks um, in the 60s and 70s, although that varies geographically um, as well and also varies over time. Um, but we do see that after those ages, um, people living with diabetes um, have a shorter um, survival than other people. So that's why it peaks and then starts to decrease. Um, but I think also um, we should, you know, make sure that we're not just getting stuck on one age group or only older adults. Um, diabetes is really a condition that affects people of all ages. Um, and we've really been seeing, um, instead of some of our research shows that um, onset of diabetes is becoming earlier and earlier. Um, and so prevalence among younger adults um, is also increasing over time. Um, so we also need to take that into consideration. And Dr. Ong, what are your thoughts in terms of looking at the different age groups? Should we be compartmentalizing them that way or look at, at, look at um, this issue as, as more of a, a, a lifetime issue? Um, I think that we definitely need to look at it as a lifetime issue in terms of thinking about the impact of diabetes on society. Um, and, and our future. I think that when we, however, when we think about interventions and when we think about policies and we think about how can we address um, the diabetes situation, we may need to think about it in, in terms of buckets just because of what the drivers are. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine, you know, where physical activity, tobacco, you know, these, these different modified, modifiable risk factors, they impact the different age groups differently. Um, it, it could be, it's a lot easier to perhaps shift someone's uh, behaviors on food when they're much younger than when they're much older. Um, physical activity is just going to be different in different age groups. Um, aging, because of what we know that their risk uh, of aging on diabetes is gonna be different. So how we package um, what, how we package the different policies and how we package um, our approach may need to vary by age groups, but it will just be the same components, but maybe in different weights or maybe in different um, strategies. Um, but they all are important. They all do need to play a, a role. It's just, it's unlikely that it will be a one size fits all like pill that you could give to everybody from a 10 year old to a 90 year old and it causes the same um, change. And Dr. Ong, finally, um, you spent so much time, you and uh, Lauren, on this research looking at diabetes data from more than 200 countries. What would your main message be to the public? And would it be different from your message to policymakers? Um, I think that my main message to the public would be that diabetes Every, I think many people have heard what diabetes is. Um, it's, it's a very, very old disease. It's not new. Um, and I think that we've become complacent in, in what diabetes is from a, perhaps like from a public level. Um, and I think that it, what we're seeing and what we've seen in this research is that it's increasing everywhere. And we know that it doesn't need to increase like this everywhere. Um, we know that it doesn't need to be increasing in younger ages. And we know that maybe it doesn't need need to be increasing at the rate it's increasing and to have people be a little bit more um, understanding and thoughtful of the drivers of it just because the drivers are so intertwined within your system and it's intertwined in the choices we make today um, and so just to realize that and that more attention needs to be paid and from a policy um, perspective I think my main message to them would be is that we can't think about diabetes from uh, different segment, a specific segment. So we can't say we want to intervene at high BMI and only high BMI without thinking about all the other things that are happening. Um, we can't, if we do that and we don't remember about the impact of complications and the fact that no one, uh, very few people are going to, well, it's more difficult to identify those who have diabetes earlier in the stage in many locations. I think we need to think about this from a holistic perspective all the layers, get all the stakeholders at the table and kind of think about this as a long-term kind of challenge and how are we going to tackle this for generations? Well, the research is so layered and there's so much context that you provided. Dr. Leana Ong and Lauren Stafford, thank you so much for being with us on this podcast about diabetes. Thank you. Thank you.